The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Powell fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypowell.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Wadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we are delighted to welcome some true rising stars, up and comers in the uh, geriatric palliative care research world. First, I want to introduce Deborah Ejim, who is assistant professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and a trained medical sociologist. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And we're delighted to welcome Deep Ashana, who is Assistant Professor of Medicine at Duke University and is a pulmonologist and intensivist by training. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Deep. Thanks so much. I'm glad to be here. We're going to be talking about structural racism in geriatrics and palliative care. Um, But before we go into that topic, somebody has a song request for Alex, doesn't... Who who has the song request? I do. Debra, what's the song? (laughs) It is Old Child by the Five Stair Steps. And why this song, Deborah? Well, I think it's appropriate for the time now. It's an uplifting song. But I have to be honest with you, when you <laughs> when I had to think about a song request, um, I just so happened to be watching The Simpsons with my children and the song came on. (laughs) Which episode of The Simpsons was it? (laughs) Well, it was a good song. It was a song where uh, it was an episode where he um, where somebody wrote the word faith on the tree in a backyard and it kind of renewed his um, hope in mankind. So it was a good episode. uh, One of the better episodes, but I'll be honest, that's that's I great. heard it and then sent the email. I love it. That's a first. <laughs> great first for Jerry Powell from the Simpsons. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Great mm-hmm. choice. Ooh, child, things are gonna get easier. Things will get brighter Ooh, child Things are gonna get easier Ooh, things will get brighter Someday, yeah We'll put it together And we'll get it undone Someday When your head is much lighter Someday, yeah We'll walk in the rays of a beautiful sun Someday when the world is much brighter Bravo Nice choice, Deborah. Thank you. Someday. <laughs> Someday. Yeah, it's been tough. COVID. Uh, yeah. How are how are the COVID things happenings in your areas of the world? How are they in North Carolina deep? I think you came off service recently. I did. I was in the ICU um, and we had the post um, holiday surge to contend with. So it was pretty busy. And I think, you know, the unique thing now is also that there's just tremendous staff shortages. So we had to, for example, at the VA in Durham, close an entire ICU because there were so few nurses in the hospital. So wow. it's just so far into the pandemic. So many people are still getting sick and now healthcare workers are sick in such large numbers too. So mm-hmm. it's it's challenging. Yeah. And how about in Alabama, Deborah? Um, the same is happening here. We're having um, a lot of uh, staff shortages. Um, it's especially um close to me and that my mom is an ICU ICU nurse and has been for 31 years. Mm. My sister's a pulmonology fellow. And so although I'm not a nurse, I hear the stories of just how um difficult staffing is and how short they are and how exhausted they feel. So um 
my heart really goes out to all of you all Mm -hmm. for taking care of us. Well, I want to thank both of you being on this call, despite being in the the surge right now. And we're going to be talking about structural racism in geriatrics and palliative care. And I'm wondering, before we go into this topic, can we take a kind of step back and just help define what do we mean when we say structural racism? Yeah, so um, you know, I think that term has been used a lot recently. So um, that's a good question. That's worth sort of pausing to um, really define what we're talking about. So I think you know, racism is um, sort of ever present in our society. It's ubiquitous, and um, it acts through different channels. Um, and so the structural piece of it um, is just one of the channels through which racism acts. You know, uh, traditionally people will sort of say that there's structural racism, institutional racism, interpersonal racism. Um, so those are the different levels through which it operates. And so structural, some examples of that that people might be familiar with would be, you know, the structures of society. So things like gerrymandering or redlining. Um, so structural um, bias and housing and um, and politics and voting and things like that. And, you know, as relevant to what we're talking about, um, I think some um, examples of that would be geographic distribution of high quality hospices, for example. Um, so that would be one example of structural racism as relevant to geriatric and palliative medicine. Um, institutional racism is, you know, racism that operates at the level of institutions, so health systems um, in this example. And then interpersonal would be um, between people, um, so between physicians or other types of clinicians and patients and families, for example. So this the podcast title is actually not structural racism, geriatric health care. It's structural and institutional racism in uh, geriatric health care. Is that right? Because we're going to be talking and maybe about... even interpersonal. Yeah. And even, yes, yeah. Interpersonal, yes. Yeah. And I would say, you know, that when I think about these types of um, the different levels through which racism operates, sometimes actually I focus more on the latter two because those seem more within my control um, to modify, you know, like it's more within my control, definitely to modify the interpersonal um, aspects of racism and maybe even the institutional um, aspects through things that I can do at the level of my hospital and community. But as a researcher... Yeah, as a researcher, perhaps there's, you know, more levels of influence that we can exert. um, But yeah, so I think all of those are worth considering for sure. Mm -hmm. Deborah, anything you'd add? Yes, so as uh, Deep was saying, institutional racism is more focused on the institutional level. It's actually the policy and practices of an institution, um, whether it's intentional or not, that favors one group and disadvantages another group. And oftentimes we see privilege given to uh, associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color. And so um, we see this in research, um, not only um, just uh, palliative care research, but across the board in what's being reported, um, even how the sample is recruited Oftentimes we see that landmark research for which policies are created from are not really representative of the U.S. population, and and that's an issue. So um, these are things that we need to work on to fix, you know, one study at a time, um, one project at a time. I think that things can get better. Deborah, um, how how did you get interested in this as as an academic focus? Um, for your career? Well, my life kind of drives, uh, my personal spirits kind of drives um, my research interests. Um, growing up in the South, um, in a family, a uh, lower middle class family, um, you got to see a lot of things. And like I said, my mom has been a nurse for 30 years. And um, so we've always, want, I wanted to be a doctor, but that's a, another story for another day of why I'm not. But um, so, we um, just hearing the stories that my mom would tell about her patients. She worked at a hospital here in Birmingham that served um, under-resourced individuals, um, mostly African-American. And I got so interested in the, the communication um, aspect of it. She would, uh, there's one story that I always tell where um, she had an African-American patient. She was in the room with an African-American patient um, and the, the clinician was in the room. The clinician was di- diag- um, talking about prognosis and diagnosis with the patient. And the patient just, you know, shook their head in the affirmative the whole time, you know, with all the big words coming out. 
<clears throat> I think the doctor or the clinician thought um, that they aced the aced it. They walked out and say, you know, he completely understood everything I said. The mm -hmm. patient beckons my mom to come back and said, nurse, can you explain everything he said? I don't get a word. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get a word of what he said. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you just see this a lot with her working in the ICU, those goals of discussion, um, goals of care discussions um, are always difficult. You know, she's often having to talk about what does resuscitation really look like? What does CPR really look like on a frail 90 year old body? You know, when you say um, that you want resuscitation, do you know what this means? Would this be a traumatic experience for you? Either way, um, it's your choice. But uh, those things like that have always had me interested. And in 2020, I had my own experience with serious illness um, mm. for almost 45 days. I was in the hospital. Um, in the ICU on ECMO and ventilator. Wow. And I myself witnessed um, communication issues, even being educated and being in the hospital, all that really didn't matter when you were so sick. My uh, mom and sister being medically trained, it was still was a different ball game having me so sick in the hospital. Um, I was, I got admitted in April. Um, that was like a maybe three weeks into the pandemic and no one was allowed to come and see me. Mm. So just imagine mm. the communication issues that my um, family had to deal with over the phone, the decision to whether to, to get me a trach or to do this procedure or to do that procedure um, was really difficult for them to make, even though they knew, okay, if I don't get this done, she might not make it. And so that, made me think of, okay, I, I'm really lucky to have these, my family and my great uh, colleagues who are here medically trained that can speak up on my behalf. But what about those who cannot, who don't understand and don't have anyone in their family who understands how are they making decisions? How are they feeling assured that they're getting the best care? So coming from that, um, wake, uh, having, I had a spiritual, I guess, and physical awakening um, that this work really needs to be done because it was hard for me here. And I think I know a few things. There are people that just don't get it at all. And do they even make it out? Do they even make the right decision? Mm -hmm. Do they know the questions to ask? There were times when um, my family would question certain procedures mm -hmm. because of the medical knowledge they had and they were right, you know, and who's there to advocate for people who are in a similar situation uh, of color or not as educated and mm -hmm. just, you know, you just don't understand the medical lingo. I, I feel like sometimes, you know, we're talking um, two languages mm -hmm. between the patients and caregivers. So that's how I got interested yeah. in this area. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. I completely agree. There's so much hidden that we don't see, right? both in terms of the story of your mom and like patient asking her, I didn't get anything of what, the, what this, uh, what this doctor just said. I'm sure that happens all too frequently. And so many patients who don't have the family resources and advocates that you had, fortunately, um, who I worry about, um, um, and I'm we just don't know if, about. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if they're having gone through that, like, was there like one thing that, either surprised or angered you the most about that experience? Yes. <laughs> like I said, my education didn't matter. <laughs> so mm -hmm. being traked, you know, on a ventilator, no one knew who I was. So for better or worse, in one situation in particular I think about is when I was coming, um, I was on trach collar at the time. And so I would get these breathing treatments one had, I can't remember the, but it was an addictive, or normally addictive medication to numb the track deep. You may be able to help, help me out. One of the breathing treatments they give you to help you to be able to handle um, tray collar. Um, and I think maybe it had Dilaudid or something like that in it. And mm -hmm. so I was coming off of it. Um, so the respiratory therapist at night told me, so you don't have it scheduled for every six hours anymore. So you, if you need it, you need to ask for it. In my foggy state, I thought he meant 
keep up with it yourself every six hours. Like look on oh. your phone and say every six hours you need this. Yeah. It's not getting that. Okay. If you're not short of breath, if you're fine, don't ask mm-hmm. for it. So in the morning, uh, another respiratory respiratory therapist who was white comes in and I say, oh, the guy told me to ask for that breathing treatment that I need. He said, ask for it every six hours. I'm just not thinking of any, you know, just that's just my mind. And she looks at me and then she um, turns and walks away, like doesn't even acknowledge me. And my mom was in the room and I was like, see, this is why people hate the hospital. This is why people hate me die. because she didn't even tell me like she just rolled her eyes and walked out. Like, does she think I'm going to try to get high on a breathing treatment? You know, and, and I, I remember starting to get really upset and almost in tears. And I'm like, can you can I go home? Can you find a way for me to go home? I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm definitely not here to abuse any um, medications. And so my mom had explained to me, oh, you know, I saw what you did, but it's okay. The reason you can't get it is because you're not short of breath. And I was like, that's all she had to say. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't get that. And so I just think about people who had those negative experiences and just refuse to go back or adhere to medical advice because they've had such a bad experience. You lose trust, you know, you, you're just like, I'm on my own. That's how I felt. And so I just feel like when you meet a patient, kind of think about what what's their backstory, what have they, um, what might they have experienced before, what may their uh, family members have experienced, uh, you know, had, have had a negative experience with um, clinicians, and therefore you're thinking they're just difficult when they have really serious trust issues that have never been addressed or yeah. you know, never even meant nothing. I, I mean, I, I'm to this day, I don't even think that she probably thought about what she did really hurt my feelings. Two years later, I still think about it. I can still well, see. It also reminds me of the health affairs article that just came out yesterday yeah. about um, uh, in the EHR, Black patients were had a like 2.5 odds greater of having a negative descriptor in their chart, like being resistant yeah. or non-compliant. Yeah. Um, and just imagining like what did that respiratory therapist put in the chart and yes. how much of that has to do with what we're talking about today, institutional and structural racism or in a I wonder also like how you know emblematic this is of other people's experiences. So like I think what you're talking about is like the assumptions that clinicians yeah. are making about patients without knowing anything about them simply based mm-hmm. on the color of their skin. And then the other thing that stuck out to me, Deborah, about what you said is the word advocacy. Mm-hmm. You know, families advocate for patients, but how clinicians perceive that mm-hmm. is very different also based on the race of the family or the patient. So in mm-hmm. some cases we say people are being difficult, they're being pushy when what mm-hmm. they're trying to do is advocating. And, you know, in your case, that's so clear and that's been clearly demonstrated in the literature that there are these very different assumptions made about patients and families. And then also when they do their best to advocate for their loved one, that's perceived so differently by clinicians yeah. too. They get actually wrote a paper on this, us. didn't you, Deep? Yeah. Uh, uh, with a terrific title, I should add. Don't talk to them about goals of care. That's in quotes. Understanding disparities in advanced care planning. This was in the journals of gerontology, medical sciences. Um, could you tell us about that research? Sure. Yeah. So we did, um, this was a qualitative study of about 70 clinicians at six um, health systems across the country. And, um, you know, we simply asked them about their approach to advanced care planning and then um, sort of in a um, unbiased way, just asked, you know, are there specific patient populations with whom you have difficulty discussing um, advanced care planning? And the vast majority of clinicians identified um, Black patients as one of the groups with whom they had difficulty um, discussing ACP. And then we sort of explored, you know, what are the reasons for that? Um, And a couple of the things that came up were exactly what we were talking about, that there were a lot of assumptions um, that Black patients don't want to talk about this. Black patients will have, you know, preferences for receiving really aggressive care. Um, So what's the point in talking to them about this? Um, Those were two of the main findings. And then the other interesting finding was just that, you know, the way that we sort of do shared decision making and advanced care planning specifically in this country is a very, um, it's a, 
a specific sort of decision making, right? Because we say like identify the one decision maker who would speak to you if you can't, but that Mm -hmm. um, is not culturally relevant for all patients and families. Sometimes they want to identify one people. It also assumes that people think they have agency in determining their future, right? That it's okay to talk about what you want your future to look like, but um, in some religious traditions that may not be um, aligned with uh, what people feel comfortable doing. So there was also this concept of, you know, the way that we conceptualize ACP may not really fit for um, all patients and families. Um, and then there were a couple of other things that sort of spoke to institutional racism. So a lot of people spoke about how, you know, our um, advanced directive forms are only available in English. It's really hard to get them in other languages, um, which of course um, will create structural barriers to ACP for many patients and families too. You raise this issue of, you both talk, have mentioned this issue of trust. And I want to just delve into that a little bit more and dig deeper into that because we see this often in charts. And as, you know, somebody who gets consults, um, you know, families very distrustful, fam, you know, patient mistrusts. I wonder if we could unpack that a little bit more. And I, I know you've both thought about this um, in deeper levels. Um, is it is it fair to um, label, in quotes, uh, patients as mistrustful or having trust issues? Um, I know my personal bias is that, you know, I think um, this actually highlights a larger point. It's about language and how we use language. Um, so the flip side, of course, of trust is trustworthiness, right? Why should they trust us? What have we done to demonstrate that we are trustworthy? Um, And so a lot of the language and disparities research, I think, historically has been about mistrust and low health literacy. But what about the flip side of it, right? What about trustworthiness? What about how are we communicating? Is that done? You know, as as you were saying, Deborah, is that done in a way that recognizes that the vast majority of patients actually have a very um, low health literacy because they're not experienced in the healthcare system like we are? Um, so I think it's much more powerful to frame things in the other way, which is, you know, where's the onus of change? It should lie with us to demonstrate that we're trustworthy, to demonstrate that we can communicate in effective ways. So um, that would be my response to that is I think, mm-hmm. you know, to the extent that there is mistrust, it's very justified. And um, the responsibility for changing that lies with um, clinicians and health mm-hmm. systems, not patients. Deborah, your thoughts on this issue? Yes, so I wholeheartedly agree with what Deep said in that when you put those terms, um, mistrust, distrust, you're like blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. We're not delving into where does this mistrust come from. Oftentimes Mm -hmm. we see that in um, research um, as reasons for uh, disparity or uh, lack of African-American participation in clinical trials is mistrust but no one ever goes past that. Why is there Mm -hmm. this mistrust? Um, So this is um, really an issue. And the communication aspect is, is, like I said, it's it's really key. How can you trust somebody that you don't really understand, you know, what they're saying? And how could, how do you know that they have your best interest at heart? Um, It brings to mind a study that I completed um, on religious and spiritual um, communication in Mm -hmm. um, medical decision-making among patients and family caregivers and clinicians. And so basically in that work, I uh, did qualitative interviews with African-American patients and family caregivers with heart failure Mm -hmm. to ask about how they wanted religion and and spirituality included in their um, treatment discussions and and decisions. And, you know, we come in with the bias, especially in the South, that a lot of patients and cam- um, caregivers will be super religious. They, I did not really find that. I found a really um, just a spectrum of uh, religiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing that came to mind when I um, was hearing Deep speak is one of the quotes that I, I had from my um, work was that I feel like my clinician rushes to get to the next person. I feel like they don't spend enough time with me. You know, um, I know that everyone doesn't have, believe in the same thing that I I do, but I want to feel like this person cares about me. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big thing that came up. I want to feel like this person cares about me. So that in a personal relationship, that truly feeling like you're concerned about this patient 
is, is really important. And that needs to happen way before this person's at the end of uh, end of life. Mm-hmm. How can I, if I don't really trust you with my treatments uh, uh, early in the disease trajectory. How can I trust you to tell me to be DNR <laughs> and essentially let go? Like that's, that's hard to do. So um, that's why my work focuses on improving communication upstream with uh, patients and family caregivers and clinician and to work on exercising those communication muscles and helping patients to be able to identify what's important to them way before they, they hit the mm-hmm. end of life right. and to be able to speak with the clinician to turn it from this uh, patriarchal that the clinician makes all the decisions. You know, we do know clinicians know way more than the patients. We're not asking clinicians to say you have 15 different treatment options pick one the balls in your court that's that's too much but we want the clinician to know us enough to know that maybe these three may be an option and what do you think about that and okay does this align with your health goal with your life goals if you're on this certain treatment and and it won't allow you to go to church because it's so intensive or you 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 have to stay put or something like that and going to church is really important to you maybe we don't do that maybe we pick something else Mm -hmm. so building this relationship early. I got to I got to I got to interject here because here we've mentioned moving upstream, advanced care planning, advanced directives. Uh-oh, and we know where this is going. You know where this is going, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Sean Morrison, Diane Meyer, and I think Bob Arnold was the third author, wrote this piece in JAMA, which I'm sure you've seen. Uh, if you haven't read it, everybody all our listeners, please read it, um, saying, you know, what's wrong with advanced care planning? And um, their argument is largely based around a critique of advanced directives, saying that they, you know, there've been a zillion studies, they don't work. Um, if that is the case, um, and I know that you please feel free to critique that assumption, then uh, certainly we can all agree that the rising tide of advanced care planning, advanced directives, has not lifted all boats equally, and that there's been greater uptake among whites than people of color. Uh, should we, however, be focusing our efforts, research dollars, um, clinical efforts on bolstering advanced care planning among uh, people of color when um, there is this concern that this is an ineffective uh, intervention in the first place? Uh, thoughts about that? Maybe we'll go to deep first. Um, I'm going to sidestep that issue and say, <laughs> um, you know, I think the unintended, move? I think the unintended consequence of only focusing on this in the decision, or sorry, in the moment decision making could be that when so so we know a lot about when our um, you know sort of racial biases and stereotypes are most activated, right? It's when it's like this concept of thinking fast and slow. Uh, when we're in time pressured situations, we're making quick decisions, for example, in the ICU, mm-hmm. that is when we rely on heuristics and stereotypes the most. Yeah. And so yeah. my big concern with that as relevant to um, health equity is just that if we switch entirely to this model of in the moment decision making, I think there's huge potential to actually even further um, widen disparities because undoubtedly clinicians will rely more on these mental models that are sort of um, you know, imbued with the attitudes of a racist society mm-hmm. um, that will worsen care for um, for minoritized communities. And then I think the other piece of it is, you know, we were just talking about demonstrating trustworthiness and stuff like that. And I think that's much harder to do, you know, when you've just met somebody and you're making a decision in a really um, in a crisis versus um, sort of establishing that trustworthiness over time. So I think from the perspective um, of a health equity researcher, I think there's a lot of virtues to not abandoning um, ACP for those reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that response, Deep. Uh, Deborah, your thoughts? Um, as the site PI, the site co PI of an advanced care planning study <laughs> right, going on right now, I would think <laughs> I would say we don't need to <laughs> abandon AC, uh, ACP studies. Um, I am the Psychopi of a uh, study headed up by uh, Kim Johnson, mm-hmm. um, really brilliant uh, geriatrician at Duke University, mm-hmm. a mentor of mine and deeps. But um, in that study, we're looking at um, bringing equity to advanced care planning and events um, and completing advanced directives among 
um, African Americans, um, looking at two different models, looking at five wishes and a model called Respecting Choices. Mm -hmm. And I found that work to be really valuable. Again, these people that we are recruiting are not um, facing immediate death. However, the study started pre-COVID. Now that you know we we are in COVID, we've seen an uptick of um, people who were once well passing on us. So I think that the study is important in that area. However, I do think that upstream is really important, as I was talking about earlier. Um, just presenting this idea of advanced directive and advanced care planning when you're stressed at you know end of life um, is really difficult. Me, myself, um, I've been in the hospital a couple of times, one time for uh, pulmonary embolism. And I was asked if I wanted to see the chaplain. And me and know what I, me knowing what I know, being a palliative care researcher, do you wonder what my answer was? I was like, heck no, I do not want to see a chaplain. I do not <laughs> want to do anything. <laughs> so I just don't think that that's the right time to introduce the concept. I think that we need to have equal funding spread across the board. So we're actually uh, going to be doing a, a podcast coming up soon, I think, Alex, on advanced care planning, serious illness communication, like the differences between the two. And uh-huh. I think it's fascinating. Like, yeah. is it just a name change? Like I was talking about changing palliative care. I'm wondering if, if we can switch subjects just a little bit and maybe do it since we have like 10 minutes left, uh, do a little bit more of a discussion about particular topics in geriatrics and palliative care around structural institutional organizational racism. You know, one thing that I'm I'm seeing a little bit more of lately on Twitter is that you know, organization... I'm, I'm going to switch to now geriatrics. So if you've listened to this podcast, you know my thoughts on aducanumab as well as Alex's. But when organizations tend not to get their way, what I'm seeing lately is... Uh, there's automatically a quick jump to, oh, like I really care about diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, so I'm going to make a case that this is discriminatory because of, uh, you know, um, because it's going to have differential, disproportionate impact on Blacks and Hispanics. So literally, word for word, almost from what the Alzheimer's Association said when CMS came out with their uh, draft ruling. Um, I loved another tweet by Jonathan Jackson. Um, who I still hope I can get on a podcast sometime soon, noting that uh, he's basically said, whoa, whoa, uh, this is yet another example of an organization invoking systemic harm when it's convenient, not when it's appropriate. Let's chat, shall we? And he goes to this brilliant Twitter thread. Uh, not to just single out Alzheimer's Association, because I feel like I'm seeing a lot more of this. Like Alzheimer's Association, Harry Johns, white rich CEO, um, all of a sudden cares about diversity, equity, inclusion. Is that allyship? Is that like taking advantage of mm-hmm. exploitation of? Uh, how should I think about this? As a minority researcher who does minority health disparities research, it's a bit difficult for me <laughs> in this time um, because we're just we're really kind of seeing the disadvantage uh, switch to ob- obtaining grant and research dollars. Like this is something that I've cared about for so long mm-hmm. and in times past has been very difficult to get pro- uh, projects on minority health disparities funded. Mm-hmm. As you can see in, you know, just the amount of research you see out there on minority health disparities, it's not easy. And um, to, while I think it's great that we have so much attention on um, minority health disparities, especially in light of covid um, it just is difficult. I'll just put it, it's difficult for me now that everybody's on the bandwagon. Um, you still see these disparities. Mm-hmm. Those people are more likely to get the grant dollars than I would be as a new uh, minority, um, uh, relatively new minority healthcare or care researcher. And so I just wonder about the intentions. You know, is this something that you really care about? Or just uh, just a means to an end, a means to the getting the grant dollars, and yeah. so it's really yeah. difficult. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, and Eric, I would also I agree with um, you, Deborah, and I would also add to that. Like I think um, that 
the way that you described it, Elisa, does not seem, you know, like true allyship to me, um, not knowing as much about the situation as you do. And I think what I look for um, is that, you know, you can't just say that you care about it. There have to be tangible actions tied to it. Right. So say that the um, so then what tangible actions are there going to be to make the drug available to people who are underinsured? or uninsured, um, you know, so yeah. make the drug more readily accessible to minoritized communities. Um, cause this sort of thing, as you were saying, Deborah is happening in research, right? There's been this term been, uh, this term has been coined now, this equity tourism that people are doing disparities research because it's fundable and highly publishable. But when you look at the teams of researchers, they're not really representative of the um, patient populations and communities that they're studying. There's no sort of um, you know, understanding of critical race theory and things like that. So I think um, the the words themselves have to be coupled with, you know, representation and then true commitment and the form of policies in this example. And I think one of the, you know, one of the criticisms like with Adjikam, and I'd love to talk about, you know, uh, organizational structural racism with research is that, um, you know, the Adjikamid trial had, I think, six African-Americans in their high dose group. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, nobody really cared about that, uh, that there were no minorities or people of color in the the trials. They only cared about it once, uh, CMS decided that they may not pay for it. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about, oh, it's, it's just so hard to do these trials with and include people of color because of real structural reasons, but also because most of these memory centers where these trials are done are in... Uh, often have a very white population. What are your thoughts about kind of the organizational and structural barriers to increased participation of in people of color or, or, or other... selection of articles. Uh, Deborah, uh, maybe starting with you, you have a uh, abstract um, coming out. I think this is for the State of the Science um, yes. HPM uh, coming up next month. Which will be virtual, um, and uh, and you reviewed articles presented at the State of the Science plenary for years, um, and looked to see what sort of inclusion uh, was represented in those, and focus on disparities. Could you tell us a little bit about that work? Yes. So this um, this work was uh, led by Dr. Ramona Rhodes. and the um, senior author again was Dr. Kim Johnson. And so what we did, we reviewed articles presented at the State of the Science um, from the years um, 2004 to 2019, so about 15 years. Um, We found that we had 127 articles meet the criteria. And out of 127 articles, can you guess how many had a health disparities focus? Three. Only three had a health disparities focus. And so... This is a systemic, systematic problem with our research, you know, and it goes back to what we recommend is that there need to be more inclusive standards in how we are selecting populations. A lot of the research research that we reviewed um, was mostly white. One state had 98 percent white participants. Uh, Oftentimes when the race is described, it's just like white or non-white, non-specific terms which is an issue. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. So the standard of practice of recruitment and analysis needs to be more inclusive. Right now it centers and focuses on whiteness mm-hmm. as the as the standard, as the comparator, and then everything is um, compared to it. Again, I feel like we're blaming the victim when we say we just can't re- recruit African-Americans. In the study that I'm in, uh, that I'm the uh, site co-PI, equal ACP. Um, Dr. Johnson, again, is the PI. We have successfully recruited more African-Americans than whites. We are close to 600 participants. And I think about, um, we have 100 more Black participants than whites in a uh, large trial. So it can be done. Mm -hmm. Um, But we are intentional with our recruitment strategies, with the, the way in which we reach um, individuals. Um, we also need to think about community-based recruitment strategies, going out and meeting people where they are, as opposed to um, being in clinic in yeah. mostly, mostly urban or suburban areas. 
So there are things that we can do as researchers, and it's our responsibility when we're getting the money, we're getting the research dollars to do this, to go out and make uh, equitable um, samples and inclusive samples. Mm -hmm. Deep, any other thoughts on that? No, I was thinking of Equal ACP2 as a great um, success story. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from that trial other than the you know results of um, what you find with the ACP intervention. I think that's going to be a, um, a trial that we'll learn from for years to come uh, with regards to this issue of um, unequal recruitment. I'm also wondering, as I know we're running out of time, I just love to hear from you. It really focused on either you know, the geriatrics or palliative care. Like, this is the magic wand question. If there's one thing that, that we could do moving forward, either more of or differently, mm -hmm. what, what would you want the fields to do? Deep, I'm going to turn to you first. You mean from a research perspective? Any. You can choose any. Policy. Research perspective. Policy. Could be institutional anything. policy. <laughs> yeah. It, like something clinicians magically change your behavior and do something differently. What, what yeah, a, it's total magic. high in the sky. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I would um, focus on, um, yeah, I would say it would be the interpersonal piece of it for me. So that's what a lot of my recent work has been focused on. It's the um, interpersonal racism and that has been known. You know, dating back to the early 2000s, the Institute of Medicine Unequal Treatment Report yeah. had like a huge summary on how clinicians um, don't engage um, patients equitably in communication and shared decision making. So this has been known for, you know, over two decades that these problems are super pervasive. And that's just a really hard nut, nut to crack because it's about changing our um, yeah. stereotypes and behaviors. Um, and Is there really anything that changes that? Is this just a Besides changing what a doctor looks like um, and their background, is there anything else that we can do to change that pervasive behavior? Yeah, absolutely. Or do we there just need been, to? Yeah, go ahead. No, no, there have been um, some interventions, you know, that have worked. So um, some of the things like we talked about, there are structural barriers. So making advanced directives available in different languages, things like yeah. that. There are um, sort of low hanging fruit type of solutions, um, but then the in terms of the behavioral solutions, there are um, interventions there too. So for example, if um, there's some perspective taking interventions where um, you know you sort of intentionally step into the shoes of the person that you're talking to and try to consider their mm -hmm. perspective. So um, one of the studies that I'm leading now is about how we label patients and families as difficult rather than trying to understand why are they angry? Why are they so defensive? Well, in the ICU, of course, it's because they're in a terrible situation and their loved one is dying, you know? So sometimes it's just as simple mm -hmm. as taking a moment to take that perspective yeah. and um, to prevent ourselves from sort of othering people, right? So from classifying mm -hmm. yeah. them into this category that's different from ourselves. So there are simple interventions yeah. like that that have worked. Yeah. Um, I so, love that. Uh, it yeah. reminds me of, uh, God, what book was that again? Like taking a step back and just think like, why would a reasonable, rational, and decent human being do this and you realize yeah. oh my god there are tons of reasons like yeah. loved yeah. one's dying like this is a shock they you know, this is the first time they were able to visit because of covid like so many reasons I'm just taking yeah back. and i will end on a hopeful note which is i think like which specialty is best positioned to do this right other than palliative care like the the core of palliative care is talking to people and understanding where they come from so like if it's going to start somewhere in medicine i think that's where it's most yeah, likely yeah. to succeed. So you guys are going to lead us um, in that. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah, you got the magic wand now. Yes, I, I would have to agree with Deep, but it's more for uh, personal reasons. The uh, communication area is just so important to me. It has had a lasting effect on my life. Um, not just the hospital state that I, I recently had two years ago, but other experiences I've had when I had my son, I was a graduate school in graduate school. And so I had Medicaid and the negative experience that I had with the nurse that time made me push off going to the hospital when I knew I was having breathing issues this time. And yeah. so when I landed in the hospital, three days later, I'm on a ventilator. And so mm -hmm. just, and I don't think anybody knows that that affected me in such a big way. So having clinicians um, take the time to communicate, um, to try to understand the patient, to, uh, as you said, try to 
put yourself in that person's shoes of what they may be going through at the moment, I think it's, it's really important. Mm-hmm. Now, I like to plug um, here at UAB, we actually have a program where clinicians are trained on how to communicate bad news to people who don't look like you. So it's called the mm. ACT training, ACT um, training program here, um, provided by our uh, palliative and supportive care um, unit. And it's just really great. I've gone through it. it um, we have a chaplain who leads it. So um, they are really great at communicating with patients. And so using them as a resource is, is really important. But I think working on the interpersonal relationship with patients would be really, really impactful. Um, it would make a world of difference. It seems small, but it mm-hmm. really would. It really will. When you have your um, clinician ask you about you and not just about your condition and realize mm-hmm. that you're way more than that, Yeah. It, it, it just makes you feel like, you know, value. It makes you feel like, mm-hmm. you know, Maybe I want to try. I, I respect my uh, clinician. You know, he or she said that if I do this, I'll feel better. I'm, I don't want to let them down. I don't want to let my yeah. family down. You know, so those things I think are really important to consider. And as, as Deep said, again, I think palliative care um, is well positioned to um, lead the charge on improving communication with patients mm-hmm. and, and family caregivers and actually taking the steps to um, walk in their shoes and sympathize and empathize with Mm -hmm. um, this group of people that are going through so much. So win-win too, right? It helps the patient and family. And hopefully we feel better about our jobs too. We have better relationships Mm -hmm. with patients and families. So it's mutually beneficial to everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, Deep and Deborah, I want to thank you to be on this podcast. Um, But before we end... Alex, you want to finish up a little bit? A little more. Ooh, child. Ooh, child. Things are gonna get easier. Ooh, things will get brighter. Child, things are gonna get easier. Ooh, things will be brighter. Someday, yeah, we'll put it together and we'll get it undone. Someday, when your head is much lighter. Someday, yeah, we'll walk in the rays of a beautiful sun Someday when the world is much brighter Deep Deborah, big thank you for being on the Jerry Powell Podcast. Thanks so much for having us. And thank you, Artstone Foundation, for your continued support and to all of our listeners. We'd also like to thank our listeners who are supporting the Jerry Pell podcast at at least the $250 level. And those include Meg Walhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulski, Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Marianne Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lundeberg, and Gail Cooney. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>